Good evening and auspicious greetings, everyone. Welcome to our second of five events of our North American Cloud Lecture Series in English. My name is Stephen Chan, and I am from Toronto's BLIA Radiance subchapter. It is an honor to be your MC for tonight's event. Our lecture tonight welcomes Dr. Lewis Lancaster, Emeritus Professor of the Department of East Asian Languages at the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Lancaster has served as President, Emeritus Professor of Religious Studies, and Chair of the Dissertation Committee at the University of the West since 1992. He received an honorary doctorate of Buddhist studies from Vietnam Buddhist University in 2011. Dr. Lancaster has published over 75 articles and reviews and has edited and authored numerous books, including Prashna Paramita and Related Systems, The Korean Buddhist Canon, Buddhist Scriptures, Early Xi'an in China and Tibet, and Assimilation of Buddhism in Korea. He also founded the Electronic Cultural Atlas Initiative to use computer-based technology to map the spread of Buddhism from the past to present. Dr. Lancaster was a key figure in the creation of descriptive catalog and digitization of the Korean Buddhist canon. He was awarded the 2014 Grand Award from the Korean Buddhist Order for his contribution to Buddhism. Amazing accolades indeed. Our lecture title tonight is Wisdom and Ability. While many of us may equate wisdom as a noun or something that is had in varying amounts by different people, Dr. Lancaster has mentioned in previous lectures how having wisdom may not always be a positive thing. In a day and age where information and knowledge is plentiful, fleeting, easily accessible, ranging in accuracy, and prone to change. Seeking the truth is both essential, but a cautionary journey. If you are a fan of Dr. Lancaster's lectures as much as I am, I'm sure we're all in for a treat tonight. After the lecture, there will be an opportunity for you, our audience members, to ask questions in the Q&A function of Zoom. And so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lewis Lancaster to further deepen our wisdom with his wisdom tonight. Stephen, thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to have contact with so many people. So I appreciate all the people who have helped organize this series of lectures. And I know that it's been a number of you who are here online and my thanks to all of you as I'm sure the viewers thank you for what you've set up. So I'm speaking tonight, as Stephen said, on wisdom and ability. The ancient Greeks outlined the process of acquiring what they call wisdom. They said, first, there's information, which includes factual data. And from that information comes our knowledge. And this knowledge leads us to wisdom. It all seems very straightforward. Yet there are two famous questions that the poet T.S. Eliot asked. Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? And where is the knowledge we have lost in information? I think of a Google search and realize that I'm given millions of pages of information, but I am not always directed to those pages that may provide the knowledge I am seeking. My knowledge may indeed be lost in those millions of pages of information. It is possible that the very thing I seek is only found on page 133,452, but I will never look at 100,000 pages of search result. The knowledge I seek is lost somewhere in the immense amount of information I have before me. 
But I think that an even more difficult question is, where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? I admit that I have struggled to know how to approach this issue. Then it came to me. We have a situation in the world that exemplifies the loss of wisdom even when knowledge exists. On May 7th of this year, the control room computer system of Colonial Pipeline Corporation received a ransom note asking for millions of dollars. Hackers threatened to take control of their whole network of more than 5,000 miles of oil pipes. The message came from a group known as Dark Side. The pipeline company was powerless to stop the manipulation of their software. And the damage covered <clears throat> everything from management of the pipeline to customer billing and all financial records. Well, within a few hours, the company was forced to comply and they paid millions of dollars in ransom using 75 bitcoins. That is the understanding of our digital system on the part of the engineers who did this crime extends to virtual money, bitcoins. They don't leave a paper trail of deposits for law enforcement, even though they paid within hours. The results were damaging to lives all over the East Coast. Fuel stopped flowing and people had no gasoline available through this terrible and criminal act was a has allowed me to understand what the Buddhist texts mean when they say that wisdom is like a poisonous snake. Held the wrong way, it can turn and kill. If what those software engineers did was something quite remarkable. If wisdom is understanding something not just knowing about the facts, but a comprehension that goes to every aspect of how things in this world work, then we can truly say at one level, the engineers of dark side have wisdom. They understand the digital world to such a degree that they can remotely shut down a multi-billion dollar business operation and do so without getting identified. They don't just know about digital systems and how to use them. They truly understand them. However, their wisdom is like a poisonous snake. It can bite and it can destroy and it can even kill is an indication that wisdom and understanding is not limited to moral virtue. Even the evil can be wise. The hackers who have so much information about the digital systems, but they are led to perform acts of violence in order to gain wealth. And so they have lost wisdom in making use of the knowledge. Thus, Eliot's question stands, where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? So how should wisdom be held? Fortunately, unlike the wisdom of the computer engineers at DarkSide, we have been shown how wisdom can be a lifesaver. In the late fall of 2019, a new form of coronavirus appeared. 
It was a type that had been most feared by the medical profession. The virus was transmitted through the air and was extremely contagious. It spread worldwide in a matter of weeks and people became very ill and some died. Hospitals filled with the infected and many were on oxygen. Even those who treated them were susceptible. They too fell ill and some died. Recognizing the enormity of the outbreak, nations ordered quarantine, closure of public meetings, factories, travel. The question was, how soon could a vaccine be developed? A very small group of scientists had been doing research with the aim of dealing with cancer. One married couple in Germany, scientists, had through the years of their research, developed wisdom about how the body resists virus. They had an understanding of the whole process of our immune response. Just as the dark side engineers had an understanding of the nature of digital systems, these scientists had knowledge of how the body receives a message about objects that are potentially harmful. In, in a short space of time, they were able to develop a vaccine that carried a message to the body about coronavirus. The message is, is just a selected bit of the genetic makeup of a virus, a bit that is not able to cause the disease, but enough to alert the immune system to create antibodies against such things as the COVID infection. The use of the wisdom of the scientists in this case has saved thousands of lives, restored society to something like normal interaction and flow. Well, I think you see the story I'm telling. While dark side engineers use their wisdom to shut down business, disrupt the supplies of fuel and food, wreak havoc with their creation. The scientists who led the way to an effective vaccine used their wisdom to provide support and safety for millions of people. It, it's ironic that the dark side group has extracted some millions of dollars from their ransomware victims and it's a very small sum compared to the earnings of the German husband and wife team who were at the heart of the Moderna vaccine development. This couple, this couple had become billionaires almost overnight. There are, are situations where I know a lot but have little understanding. Every day I sit at my computer and I input words by using the keyboard or going to the internet, making a copy and bringing that data back to my pages. I know a lot about using the mechanisms of the digital age, but I understand very little. I don't understand the coding necessary to perform a function so that the pressure of my index finger on one of the keys of my computer produces a recognized letter in front of me. I just know that it works, and that's enough. This is the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Well, in, in academic life, I've seen many people who have extraordinary vision and wisdom 
in one side of life, but are unable to extend that wisdom to all of life. So Socrates may have been right when he taught that much of human wisdom is not very valuable. Much of what passes for wisdom is not really a definition of it. For example, am I wise when I admit to some weakness? Or when I'm tolerant of uncertainty? Or spend time in things like inward exploration? Is this wisdom? I would like to think that being wise means how to live in this world. The challenge is, how are we to achieve wisdom in our contemporary world? It's ironic that while we have enormous resources at our disposal, there are many unsolved problems. As I just mentioned, the amount of our digital information is beyond any level ever known in this world. It is estimated that if all the information that is on the internet were to put on old fashioned CD-ROMs and those discs were to be lined up, they would encircle the world at the equator 270 times. Now you would think this would be sufficient information to answer most questions about the world, the people in it, and the issues related to society. And yet we have e e ever more dire warnings of how we are changing the very environment that is needed for survival. So how can we have wisdom generated from our knowledge. There is no computer app that gives us a path to wisdom. One of the most popular television game shows is Jeopardy. It's unusual in that the MC gives an answer and the contestants must provide the question that would lead to the answer. We, we don't have a show that deals with wisdom. We don't have an MC who describes a reality in the world and the contestants must provide the question of what aspect of wisdom was necessary to bring it about. In preparing for this talk, I, I reread one of the Buddhist texts known as the perfection of wisdom. It describes a group known as bodhisattvas, those who have achieved high levels of understanding and wisdom. However, they are described as having troubles. We're told in the text that wisdom is beset by many troubles. As a result, some bodhisattvas can't hold on to their wisdom can't use it in the right way. Those who are unable to deal with wisdom abandon it before they have achieved a full perfection of it. They revert to greed, anger, and delusion. They're said to be like an unfired clay pot, which is taken to a stream to be used to carry water but the unfired pot is unable to hold water and simply dissolves and falls to pieces. Some bodhisattvas lose perspective. And even though they have glimpsed the vastness of the ocean, their attention gets fixed on the muddy water in an elephant's footprint and they lose sight of the great and beautiful blue sea. I think the dark side engineers fit this model. 
they have seen and understand the potential of the digital realm. They know its power, but they abandon that vision and just use their wisdom to get an immediate windfall of money. As a result, like the bodhisattvas who slide back into old ways of acting, these engineers will have to stay hidden. They will be forced to spend every day with the thought that they may yet be caught and punished. The text of the Perfection of Wisdom states that the goal for a bodhisattva who goes forward with wisdom is to be a refuge for the world, a guide for the world, an island for the world. They do not see anything that is not in harmony with perfect wisdom. As a result, they rejoiced in their life. They are grateful that they have been aided in their journey to attain wisdom. There's a true story that was made into a film called Catch Me If You Can. It depicts the life of a young man who is a genius. And because he's so smart, he discovers that he can live a life of deception and crime. He pretends to be a law student, a medical doctor, an airline pilot, and for some time gets away with it. However, the FBI is after him for forging thousands of dollars of worthless checks. The agent who is assigned to find him and stop this assault on the banking system comes to recognize that he is dealing with an extraordinary individual. When the impersonator is finally caught and jailed in another country, the FBI agent essentially rescues him and brings him back to the US for prison. After a bit, the FBI seeks help from the genius and finally offers him free freedom if he will use his wisdom to help them protect against fraud and embezzlement. And so he begins to use his wisdom and service to law enforcement. He became, if you will, a bodhisattva who comes, comes to know how important it is to live in the world. We need to know how to cope with major problems, but also how to deal with our achievements and our abilities. Through the years, I've been constantly amazed by all that Master Xing Yun has achieved. How is it that one person could have done so much living through a troubled era in Chinese history. As I now think back to all the experiences I've had with the master, one stands out as a special example of his wisdom and his use of it. When I was president of the University of the West, at a time when we were trying to get final approval from the higher education accrediting body, it was difficult to recruit students without that stamp of approval. So as a consequence, we had empty dorm space. I was asked to lease, lease that space to a professional basketball team from Shanghai. They were coming to Los Angeles to get coaching from the staffs of professional and college teams. As many of you know, Master Xing Yun was a great fan of basketball. And his, his younger years loved to get some time to shoot baskets and to scrimmage with others. 
He was pleased to have the Chinese team on the campus. And when he next came to Shilai Temple for a visit, he invited the team to come to meet him and have lunch. There was disquiet in the team about the luncheon plans. And they finally held a vote as to whether they would accept or not. They voted against attending. Well, I remember that when I went to see the master to tell him of the decision, I was dreading the task of braiding such bad news. I knew that he was looking forward to greeting the team and talking to them about the game and their experience. When I met with him and some others to pass along the news, many wanted to expel the team from the campus. They were very upset by that decision and felt that it was disrespectful to the master and showed a lack of gratitude for the campus accommodations. As was his pattern, the master listened for a bit and finally raised one hand and said, I completely understand these young men and why they would feel uneasy having a meal with me. I would have been the same if I was in their situation. Leave the boys alone, but tell them that I'm praying for their success. Even when being rejected, his first thoughts were for the welfare of those young men. He had no anger, just understanding and compassion for a group who were ill-prepared to enjoy the setting with monastics and non-sport people. As I remember that moment, it was a gift to see someone display wisdom and quiet concern, while others were filled with anger and resentment. No wonder the master has built a global community. No wonder that he survives hard times and moments of great achievement. We can only wish that we use our abilities in ways that enhance life, that we don't give in to exploiting opportunities without compassion and concern for those who are affected by our action. At least we have some models for helping us to determine how we will live with ourselves and with others. Yes, yes, it does appear that wisdom is an ability and that it can be used to either damage or help our world. The challenge is before us in every day, in every moment. May we all hold on to whatever level of wisdom we possess in such a way that we do not harm or limit, or limit the happiness and the success of others. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lancaster. Um, it was just really, really enlightening to hear those examples of how wisdom can be used for good and, and for evil. Yet there is, in a, in a way, an aspect of impermanence, if I'm interpreting it correctly, is that you, know, you can always flip it, that wisdom, from a weapon to become a constructive tool with those wonderful stories and and also to to cap it off with that story about master senior such an amazing role model to the global community in terms of how to use that ability of wisdom 
you know, to, to hone it with compassion and understanding. And then we can definitely lessen or, or do no harm to others. So thank you. Thank you for, for those stories and your insights. At this point, we'll also be taking questions from our audience members. We'd like to invite our audience members to use the Q&A function to ask questions or for our watchers on YouTube as well to ask their questions away. And then our uh, panelists, our IT team will help uh, populate the Q&A function. And so I do see a question there right now, Dr. Lancaster. So I'm going to go ahead and read it out. So in the Buddhist perspective of wisdom, is there wisdom without morality? Hi. Yes, thank you for the question. And thank you for your comments, Steve. Um, I think in the, in the Buddhist text, what we are reading is to say that if wisdom is this understanding of how things in the world work, you can have it actually without morality. We see it. You can. You can do it. So therefore, it puts an extra burden on us. <laughs> Not only do we have to try to get to find wisdom, but we have to understand that the wisdom which we find must be used in the right way. That's why it's an ability. And abilities are how you use them for good or for, for bad. So. Thank you for the question. Our next question, uh, Dr. Lancaster, says, uh, Professor, you mentioned that some bodhisattvas can't hold on to their wisdom and are like unfired clay pots. Did the Buddha mention how these bodhisattvas could hold on to their wisdom? Yes. Uh, like unfired pots. What's wrong with an unfired pot? It, they're not ready to receive water. They need to do what's necessary to make themselves water, <laughs> waterproof. And looking at the, and focusing on the muddy water in a footprint, uh, they're saying this, this is where you have to understand that if you get fixed on, a, on a, something that is minor and something that is off to the side, then you're, go, you're going to miss the, the real message of Buddhism. So uh, we, we have to, um, Buddha was saying to bodhisattvas, do your practice. Make yourself ready to, to perform at the highest level you can. Deal with your issues. Uh, make sure that when you go to the river to pick up some water, you're ready to do that. Or make sure that you're not just focused on dirty water and a footprint but have a vision which takes in a wider scope. Thank you. It's uh, so interesting that, you know, yes, even the unfired clay pot can be admired as well <laughs> for, for what it is and what it's going through, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. Our next question is actually coming from our YouTube side, from Neptune uh, Ng. So it says, hi, Dr. Lancaster, this is Neptune here. Thanks for your lecture. Can you please differentiate uh, prajna, prajna uh, from wisdom, please? Oh, well, <clears throat> wisdom is just our equivalent for the Sanskrit word prajna. Prajna, as, as, a, as a word, has the prefix pra, P-R-A, and that means going far beyond something. And J and A is cognate with our English word, no. 
So this prajna simply means that you go far beyond the usual knowledge. So there's, there's no, I don't mean to imply a difference between my use of the word wisdom and prajna. It's just that I chose to use the English equivalent rather than the Sanskrit word. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is the following. What can we do to encourage people with great knowledge to use their abilities to benefit all rather than harm others or only benefit themselves? Well, I, I remind myself all the time, the Buddhist texts tell us, don't do anything for others until you've done it for yourself. In other words, don't start out, we can't just start out saying, I have the answer for the world. We have to ask ourselves individually first, do I have the answer for myself? Am I really ready to deal with wisdom in this world? And if not, what do I need to do to make myself waterproof? <laughs> How can I, I give myself the impetus to lift my eyes from the muddy water and try to see a wider vision. So I think that for myself, I, I worry less in a way about how in the world can we make other people do what we want them to do. Um, I'm convinced that if we can do it ourselves, that is our best way to teach others. I know in, in, in the prison work, one of the people who started meditating with our Buddhist visiting group uh, attracted other prisoners. He never said anything. He just sat on his cot and meditated. And these people would watch him day after day until they couldn't stand it anymore. And then they would go up to him and say, what are you doing? What is this? And he said, well, I'm meditating. Well, what's meditation? And before you know it, he had brought another person into wanting to deal with that aspect of their life. And he did it by doing it himself and continuing to persevere and to do it all the time. And that's, that's one of the, that's a way which any of us can use. We may not have a worldwide audience. We may not have a way to influence the people we would like to in, in one sense, but in another sense, we, we are incredible teachers for everybody who's around us. We teach them wordlessly sometimes. And maybe that wordless teaching as the Buddhist texts say, wordless teaching may be the best just by looking at us and seeing what we do, people will learn. Thank you. That's Thank you, Dr. Lancaster. It's uh, it's true, you know. Sometimes um, by being a, a one that embodies right the right abilities or the right qualities, that in itself can model to others how there could be a different way to operate or behave. And our next question is actually in a similar vein, although it's more specifically geared towards asking if we were to advise our younger generations, our youth, about how to use their knowledge wisely to benefit our local community in their daily life. Is there perhaps a different take or a different twist when encouraging our youth to gain or use wisdom in a more beneficial way? Well, I, I think that um, as a parent, I can say that sometimes uh, it was very difficult to 
know how to give my children a model for how to act. Well, I, I think that um, with young people, they need a lot of different kinds of models. They don't just need one. Life is complex. So I remember uh, Carl Jung, the psychologist, and somebody asked him, uh, Dr. Jung, does your son come to you for advice? And he said, no, I'm his father. He goes next door to the woodworker and asks for his advice. And they said, well, does that upset you? And he said, no, because the woodworker's son is over here all the time asking for my advice. In other words, we, we live in a societal world and we need to help our children be in an environment where they see a variety of models that they can look to and, and, and admire. And I think we have to be very careful uh, that we don't create a situation where our models are negative. And I think may, people who make movies are always on, on the demand on them for societal issues are very great in television shows. What are they modeling for the youth who watch it? And how do you, how do you uh, begin to uh, help people, and particularly young people? I'm living with my sister in Los Angeles during this time. So we're together during the quarantine. And I take a walk every day. And there's a little five-year-old boy, he's now six. And he likes to greet me. And he watches me as I walk by with my cane, old man. And I told people who've watched my other lecture series about one of the things he said. One day I said, oh, how are you? And he said, oh, I've, I've been down to the beach. We live near the beach. Been down to the beach and and I got knocked over by a wave and my head went under the water. And I, I guess I looked very concerned and he said, don't worry, I just stood up again. Um, it's not that we old people have all the answers. Our children are sometimes very wise and we need to listen to them. And listening to them is to inspire them to know that they can have these wise thoughts themselves. So I, I think that part of what the Buddhists are constantly showing us is uh, not to feel that we are, that we have the answer. I don't have the answers. I try my best, but I don't have the answers. I'm 88, I don't have the answers after 88 years for pity's sakes. How long does it take? You know, I keep thinking to myself, how long is it gonna take me to grow up? And now that I'm this age, I realize, no, no, the question for me now is, how do I grow old? That's the bigger issue for me. It's not growing up, it's how to grow old. So I, I really like this little boy. And I, I, I really listen to what he says to me. And I, I, the other, the last thing he said, and I'm sorry to say all this, the last thing 
He said, I stayed up to midnight last night. I stayed awake. And, and, and his father was, he said, I know I, he wouldn't go to sleep. He just wouldn't go to sleep. And everybody else went to sleep. And he said, I was still awake. And he looked very proud and he said, yes, yes, I was the last man standing in the wind. <laughs> of that we all need to, to feel that sometimes, to be wait, wait, persistent, wait. to have, have the energy to do some things. And once in a while, we'll be the last one standing in the wind. But that's, our, that's, that's this idea that if you want to accomplish something, it's work. And it's, it's not so straightforward. And we have to be open to the differences, the, the constant change, all of these issues. But thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lancaster. It certainly uh, reminds us that it takes a village to to raise a child. You know, all that wisdom and all that modeling can be great for the, the young people. But on the flip side, we can also learn from the youth around us as well, and also gain wisdom from observing things in, in nature, from, from crashing waves to other natural events to uh, wisdom can be gained in non-human forms as well. Uh, uh, we have a, a little bit of time for just a couple more questions. So our next one here is an interesting one as well. It's from one of our audience members. Every time I try to do the right thing, I seem to get burned. My wisdom tells me to retreat from everything. How do I keep going and act properly? Well, I think back to the story I just told you about Master Shingyun. In a way, what happened with that basketball team, he could have thought, I think, and even very close to what you're saying, he could have thought, I do my best. I start a university. I, I give these young men such an opportunity, and here they are. I get burned. They turn against me. They won't let they won't come and have lunch with me. And I think that what is modeled for me was to say, can, can you have compassion for the people who are there around you? Can we have compassion for the person who burns us? Hard to do. I don't say I can do it. But I think that this is where the Buddhist tradition is saying to us, you can't, you can't just rest on your laurels. You can't just say, hey, I'm a wise person. So therefore, you should really treat me nicely because I'm wise. Or like with the prisoners, when I go to the prison, they're really prepared for me to treat them as if they're renegades lost, never to be looked at as real people again. So, so life presents us with a lot of burns. We get burned all the time and we, we say, how can this be? Do I deserve this? So I, I've said in my other lectures that when my wife had terminal cancer and we lived through such a hard time with, with her painful death, it was so easy for me to get up in the morning and think, how can this happen to me? Why is this happening to me? Can I do this? This is so hard. This is more than anybody should be asked to bear. But my wife 
seemed to read my mind and took hold of my hand and said, we can do this. And that's all it took. We just need somebody to take a hold of us and say, you can do it. You may get burned. You may have struggles. You may have things that just seem like for pity's sakes, why do, why do I have to face such troubles, such hardships? But we, we can do it under the worst of circumstances. So compassion and, and wisdom are not marshmallows. They're not just soft and sweet. Compassion can sometimes be really bitter. Can I have compassion for somebody who treats me poorly? Can I really truly have compassion for them? Can I work through my anger and my resentment? So I think the message I'm trying to say as I read the Buddhist text is, wisdom and compassion are not a piece of cake. They're not just something which you can say, oh, of course, I'm compassionate. <laughs> we have to live it. And living it can be very different than saying it. I could say a lot to you, you know, I have the platform. <laughs> I could say a lot of nice words, but I, I have to realize my words don't mean a thing if I can't learn from them myself. They mean nothing. They will do no good. So I'm usually just teaching myself when I give a lecture. I need it. <laughs> I need a lot of teaching. I need a lot of help. I'm not sure, I'm still not sure that I can go down to the river and have water poured into me. And I'm not sure that I always think about the ocean and the sea and not the muddy water at my feet. But you know, this is the difference between what some people think, which is, shouldn't a religion make sure that I have no trouble, that I have no suffering, that I have no pain. The Buddhists never say that. They never promise that. The first noble truth is there is anguish. It's, it's a given. So if we're a religion that's gonna help you We've got to help you deal with anguish. Can't do away with it, but to help you or to help myself be able to withstand it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lancaster. We are uh, currently at the one hour mark, but could we you know, uh, ask you for a few more questions? Sure, I'm yours. Oh. oh, wonderful. Thank you. I think our audience members would be excited to hear your responses. So we're going to aim for three more questions. <laughs> our next one is the following. Dear Dr. Lancaster, could you provide some aspects for discussing the relationship between the notion of Buddha nature and the prajna or wisdom? Oh, that's a, that's a tough question. <laughs> but what are we here for except to try to deal with tough questions, right? As I read the text, and, and I know that there are people who interpret the fact that, that they say we have Buddha nature, so all we have to do is to discover it. But 
Many of the texts that I read, I read it slightly differently. I read it that they say, we have the basis for Buddha nature. Now do something about it. We have the basis, it's all there. But our, our practice, our, the way we live, the way we think, the way we speak, the way we act in our life, that is the wisdom which helps us to take that basis for Buddha nature and help bring it to a reality. I'm not sure that it's so easy that it's just lying there within us waiting for us to see it and stumble over it and say, oh, oh, I didn't know I had this. I have Buddha nature. It, it's like saying, you got all the ingredients. You have everything that you need for this. Now you must use your ability to bring it to realization. Thank you. Thank you. Our second last question is a short one, but I think a powerful one too, is watching the display of wisdom by others, wisdom itself. I, I think that well, take the story of the master with the basketball players. I saw that. I witnessed it. It was part of my experience. But I have to say that just seeing it as, as, as impressed as I was, it didn't mean that I could do it myself. Doing it myself to be able to, to have such immediate concern and compassion for somebody who does me a deed which I think is bad. So I can, I can observe, and that's good. We need these models. But then I, I have to do it. I can't just think it. I have to think it, that's good. I have to say it, that's good. And I have to have my body do it, that's also good. These are the three forms of, of, of karma, body, speech, and mind. We must learn how to say it, think it, and actually have our body and our whole self involved in doing it. Now, it is really helpful if you're learning how to swim, it's really helpful to see somebody swim. But just when I see somebody swimming, I have not yet myself learned how to do it. It's helping me. I'm going to make use of that. And it's going to give me some model for how I should do, I should move my arms like that and in that way. But, but seeing another person do it, as wonderful as that is, there are times when you can only sit there and, and say to yourself, I have a lot of work to do. I have a lot that I need to do to myself because I wouldn't have acted like that. I wouldn't have been like that. And yet there's somebody who didn't act like I would have acted. So I need to think about it. And I need to sometimes to practice with things that are smaller. 
but uh, so when somebody does something to me that I think is wrong, can I say today, when that person does something to me that I think is wrong, I'm going to try to understand them. But these are, these are, this is all work, <laughs> but it's good work. And it's like a, a day when you accomplish a lot. At the end of such a day, you feel, you feel good. Today I finished doing something which I've been trying to finish for a long time. So we get our rewards and we get them directly. So thank you. As a swimmer myself, I appreciate that analogy so much, Dr. Lancaster. <laughs> it's, it's so true that just by observing an Olympic swimmer doesn't mean that we can immediately become one. And perhaps even with the, the way they're doing things, if we were to try it right away, we might even hurt ourselves. <laughs> and so yeah. we should do things a bit at a time and celebrate the success of that incremental growth. Uh, absolutely. And so I'm going to bring to you our final question for tonight from Dean. It says, wisdom begins when the I is not the center of our knowledge. Should we not view the world as a flowing river and our experiences are just as flowing on a raft down the river as part of the river itself? Um, I certainly agree that the ego has to get out of the way. Somehow or other, ego has to get out of the way. The only thing that, that I worry a bit about in, in the question is floating down the river, effortless, nothing to be done. I, I just have to sit there and, and flow with it. Yes, sometimes that's what we have to do. But just to go with the flow is not easy. It's not always easy. Because I have my ego involved and I want to go to the other side of the river and the flow is gonna take me the wrong way and it's gonna cause me to go down the river and I wanna go up the river and I have all kinds of issues that I have to deal with. So we have energy flows all around us, all around us. And the question is, how do we use energy flow? How, how, do we, how do we use it in such a way that it's, it's not just passive on our part? Is there no direction that we are able to give to it? And what, what are my models? I have to think about who models for me this floating on a raft down the river. Where, where is the model? I need somebody to show me what that means. So if I go back to Master Xun Yun again, uh, certainly the ego he put up, he put to one side, he just didn't have it. He just put it to one side. but he wasn't powerless. He said, I'm gonna do something for you, young men. I'm gonna pray for your success. I'm going to wish that you will be so successful. 
And I think it shocked them when they got that message. The message was that sometimes what I do, as hard as it is, can be have an impact on others. That's and there's there are times when when somebody can impact me in such a way with what they say or what they do or that it just takes the breath away from me almost. So we, we're, we struggle in our lives with how to go with the flow and yet not be completely uh, passive. I've told the story several times to uh, some of you have heard it, that I decided in the LA traffic that I was going to practice the perfection of wisdom, which is one of the perfections is patient acceptance so when I'm in a traffic jam on the freeway that I would sit there and practice patient acceptance of this situation. It's just the way it is. Let's just be patient just because there's nothing I can do about it at this moment. And I was rather proud of myself for doing that. I thought this is, this is good. I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm practicing one of the perfections. And when I told this to a group of... So this prisoner just really knocked me for a loop because he said, while you're sitting in traffic practicing your perfection of acceptance, are you also having compassion that everybody around you is in the same boat? And I had to say, no, I was strictly focused on myself and my thing. And I was not there thinking about all these people who are around me. So we have an impact. That prisoner had an enormous impact on me, he said, to me, in a sense, don't get so assured that you, you're doing something that's really wonderful and you're so great and mighty because you're doing it. And then he just said, why are you doing all that that makes you feel mighty good? What about all the people around you? Aren't they in the same boat? Aren't they all wanting to get where they're going, worried about being late, anxious, stressful. So I, I need to have lessons given to me all the time from people who remind me, it's just not about you. It's about everybody who's around you. Thank you so much for tonight's lecture and uh, also your answers to our, our many, many questions. Uh, we are so grateful for your time and energy and of course your wisdom <laughs> and the sharing of the wisdom you have witnessed in others. Uh, hopefully we can all turn it into good use. So thank you again. And to thank our you. audience members, we would like to highlight some of our next upcoming lectures in our event series. Our next lecture that will be in English will be on Saturday, August 21st. The title for this event is Self Mastery, Avalokiteshvara's Lessons on Being Wise and Skillful. And our keynote speaker for this will be Venerable Miao Huang, Deputy Chancellor for the Foguangshan Institute of Humanistic Buddhism. The start time for this lecture will be the same as tonight as well.
And for our next session, to our Chinese or bilingual participants, our next lecture will actually be happening tomorrow on June 27th. The title for this lecture is called Xingyun Da Shi De Guanghui. Speaking about Venerable Master Xingyun, and our speaker will be Dr. Charles Gao, Gao Shizhen, Zhao Shou. Dr. Charles H.C. Kao is Professor Emeritus at Cornell University, is the founder and chairman of Global Views Monthly, Commonwealth Publishing Company, and Harvard Business Review, uh, the complex Chinese edition. He received his PhD from Michigan State University in 1964 and taught in the departments of economics at the University of Wisconsin, River Falls for over 30 years. So we look forward to seeing you all again at a future lecture in our series. Thank you to everyone. Thank you again to Dr. Lancaster, and I wish you all a pleasant rest of your evening.